Welcome to iFab Online. Welcome to iFab Online. Willkommen bei iFab Online. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the iFab Asia Africa Fundraising Colloquium. Now, this is the fabest of the iFab sessions, as you probably know, and we are very pleased to have this opportunity to talk about the two continents that are probably least known to many of the fundraisers in the world. We are blessed to have the opportunity today to speak to two real experts in the field who have um, had extensive experience across Africa and Asia. And um, it's my pleasure now to introduce them very briefly and uh, bef before we kick off the session. First of all, I'm going to introduce Karen Tsai. Karen Tsai has extensive experience in Africa. She is the founder, director of the Resource Mobilization Center, executive director of United Way Ghana, executive director of the Pro Progressive Life Society Ghana, and a member of the executive management team of the Progressive Life Center. You can see from all of that that she's got extensive experience in Africa already. She has worked with international organizations as well though, such as Finca International, Adoptions Together Inc., the Environmental Working Group, the National Blood Foundation, Americans for a Fair Chance, International Planned Parenthood Federation and Affiliates, Family Health International, Center for Development and Population Activities, Africans Rising, and so on and so forth. When she emailed me her brief CV, I just about used all my paper up. So there's a much more extensive CV that I could talk about, but clearly Karen has extensive experience and she brings familiarity with the African context and exceptional international exposure and experience and a good understanding of the not-for-profit and civil society context on the continent and beyond. So welcome, Karen. Nice to have you on the panel. Secondly, to introduce Astrid van Susten. Of her more than 20 years in fundraising, Astrid has spent 10 years working as a frontline fundraiser in the US international education sector, working initially for a private school and later as senior development director at the University of California. For many years, she has specialized in major donor fundraising and strategy development. She serves on the boards of the German Fundraising Association and the European Fundraising Association as well, as well as the CFRE exam committee. She is herself a certified fundraising executive, CFRE of course, and also trained as somatic coach, offering leadership coaching and training to executives in the nonprofit sector. Of real significance for this presentation, is that she is also a Chinese studies major, speaking Mandarin to this day, must have been one of the pioneers in that regard, and is following the Chinese fundraising scene intently. With those few short words then of introduction, I hope that you see that we have a really stellar panel in my co-presenters that are going to give us their experience, their challenges, their successes, in those two vast continents of Asia and Africa. I'm going to kick off now and ask a couple of questions to the two co-presenters, to Karen and to Astrid. And first of all, ask for a ge very general question, if I may, uh, Karen and Astrid, and ask you to please sketch the fundraising landscape in Asia and Africa. Thank you for the question. And um, yes, there is, is, of course, a very, very broad uh, plane you're making up here, as uh, Asia is really not one country. Asia is many, many different countries, uh, some of which uh, we would never even uh, you know, think of as places where fundraising ha is happening. But in fact, it happens everywhere in Asia. And it, in, the, in terms of the fundraising scene, uh, many of the Asian fundraising markets are emerging markets, which, are, which means they are not very mature yet. And then we have others that are very mature, such as Japan, such as Hong Kong, Singapore, and also India. These places are pretty mature and fundraising and, and philanthropy is firmly established in the cultures there. Um, but uh, for, for our 
purposes today, I'm going to focus my remarks mostly on mainland China, as this is the market that I'm following closest. And uh, other things I can speak to in a, in a larger perspective, but um, my real expertise is really on the, on the China market, which is, again, very different from most of the others because it's very highly regulated. And that, of course, has to do with the political system that is, this market is operating in. Well, thank you, Bruno, for the introduction. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, also, like Astrid, I'm going to have to put out a small caveat about my um, contributions here. Uh, as far as what I can contribute about Africa, it will be primarily about Sub-Saharan Africa to start with. And I will ask the participants, the listeners, to keep in mind that Africa, very much like Asia, is not one country, as they know. It's 54 countries, um, each with a very distinct culture um, and an even more di distinct culture of philanthropy and fundraising. I would say that if, if I can do, make some broad sweeping statements uh, about fundraising in Africa. The one thing that I can say is that philanthropy and fundraising are very much a part of the foundational culture of all the countries, all the ethnic groups uh, on the continent. Um, individual giving, um, community giving, and as one of my colleagues from the Africa Philanthropy Network said at an AROXA meeting several years ago, his name is Tendai Morissa. He was the CEO of Trust Africa. He says that crowdfunding existed in Africa before we were glimmers in the eyes of our parents. Crowdfunding, as you know, is used for funerals, weddings, academic support through, throughout the continent. Um, more recently, of course, we are talking about the role of big business in in fundraising and philanthropy, uh, corporate engagement, social inv investment, and of course the 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 whole business of having to develop innovative um, mechanisms to sort of marshal the support of uh, big business in in philanthropy across the continent. Um, I would. I do think it's important to note that religious giving is a huge element um, on the continent currently. It's probably the, the religious networks put together across the continent are probably the largest um, donors continentally. Uh, as I was sort of preparing for this, I was looking through um, different documents and different articles written by different people. And I came across an article by Carl uh, Manlan published by Wings. And he was talking about the changing trends in African funding. And he pointed out data-based and online giving is becoming increasingly important, uh, perhaps as a function of the COVID-19 uh, mm -hmm. pandemic. But even previous to that, it, it, has, it had started. Um, it's not, it's, it's not a, a, popular, a popular mechanism at this point, but it is becoming increasingly important. Another thing I think that our participants might be interested in hearing about is the fact that across Sub-Saharan Africa, um, fundraising is only just, uh, only just gaining recognition as a professional and strategic element of an organizational strategy or a business plan. It's largely been something that has happened on an almost ad hoc basis, um, on an individual basis, and often as a, almost a second or third thought in, in developing and executing um, project or organizational plans. That's a very good start um, to sketching the scene. Do you want to sketch the scene any more, um, Astrid? Just yeah, sure. I mean, I could probably second some of the remarks that um, uh, Karen has made in the sense that this is also true in Asia and specifically in China, that um, companies are hugely important. 
uh, they as diff different from uh, many other markets actually uh, are, are responsible for about 67% of total of donations uh, in, in, on the Chinese uh, market, which is uh, <laughs> astonishingly, astronomically different from most other countries that we know of. And certainly the, the so-called Western industrialized nations, you know, where it's where company giving is co or corporate giving is fairly small in numbers and individual giving is very high. At the same time, of course, individuals are really also emerging in, in China big time uh, and, and in two ways. One is that uh, you do now have very, very large donors, people who are, have incredible means and are, are donating generously. I'll come to that a little bit later. But I also want to pick up a bit about uh, um, digital fundraising or digital donations, you know, which is huge in China. In fact, Everything and every donation, basically, except for the very large ones, goes goes via via the internet. Uh, the platforms are provided by the large digital companies such as Tencent and Alibaba and WeChat, and you basically do your donations like you do your shopping. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit similar to what what you can nowadays find on Amazon. You know where you can choose your charity that you want to um, uh, donate what they give to, but you can also actually make your own donation via their platforms, which is rather interesting. And, um, and it, I mean, digitalization has gone so far that even homeless people who are on the street begging for money do this with a cell phone. Wow. So you actually, uh, you send money to them via WeChat and this is how you can support them. So this is quite, quite uh, uh, advanced in that regard, you know, and obviously this, again, goes to uh, the, the highly regulated market. So mm. Chinese authorities rather you know, prefer to have it this way than to not know what's going on. That's an excellent foundation to start off from. Thanks for that. And some interesting kind of <laughs> nuggets, I think, to take away. Let's drill a little deeper then, you know, having had that foundation from which to build. What would you say are the major advantages of fundraising in Africa and in Asia? In Africa, what, what could be construed as an advantage at this point is that, as I said earlier, philanthropy and fundraising is, a, is, is an integral part of the social fabric um, of community in, in Africa, pretty much across the continent. Mm -hmm. And so giving is, 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 a, is expected and recognized as something that as individuals and good corporate citizens, we must do. This, this does help um, in fundraising. Of course, there are also uh, several, several different causes, uh, several easily identified causes and packaging for causes that makes it easier um, to fundraise on, on the continent, I would guess. But, um, that being said, I, I don't think these these are things that are not existent in in other um, communities in other in Asia, for example. Um, so it's it's it, while it may at first appear to be uh, an advantage, it it actually isn't because there's a uh, there's a, a large universe of entities that are seeking funds um, all with the same advantages. So then it kind of becomes a bottom line rather than a, an advantage um, in fundraising matters. That, that's good, Karen. Okay. Thank you. Astrid? Yeah, I would say probably the largest, uh, largest advantage uh, is that these are, many of them are emerging markets. Mm. So philanthropy is developing um, and um, different from places like the US where it's um, philanthropists themselves are extremely sophisticated in how they expend their money. Uh, here, I think the, the chances for fundraisers are to really, you know, help philanthropists form a vision of what it is that they want to accomplish, which is very much the role of a fundraiser as a facilitator between need and, 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 and wishes of, of uh, people. Who, who have the means to, to give more than others. So in that regard, I think there is uh, opportunity and advantage, if you will. Um, 
similar to what Karen is saying, I mean, it, it, giving is, of course, it has been embedded in, in Asian customs for millennia. Mm. This is not new. Mm. And, you know, there's a large Muslim population in parts of Asia. And, and obviously, there it is very, very prevalent that you give during your lifetime. And, uh, and the same is actually true also for other, other cultures in Asia, you know, the it, Buddhism uh, absolutely includes uh, supporting others and uh, even ancient Chinese philosophy calls for support of those who are not as fortunate as others. So this is, this is deeply embedded in, in, the, in the overall culture, but it is also not developed. I think it is important to keep in mind that there is opportunity, but you need to be very creative and you need to be very organized in order to make use of it. Yes. Um... Can I add to that? Please. Um, I, I completely ag agree with Astrid and I love, I love the fact that what I viewed as challenges, she has, she has turned into advantages. This is the, this is the key to a, a successful fundraising executive. Astrid, I need to come to you for tips. Um, you know, um, I, 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 I completely agree that they are emerging markets in, in so many ways. Um, and I think, as Astrid, Astrid pointed out, because they're emerging markets, there's at this point in, in Africa, generally speaking, I think there's very limited data. There's, there's very limited um, information about uh, who is giving and what they're giving and how much they're giving uh, to guide the fundraiser. But that is an opportunity because there is a, there is a space there to, to create uh, strategies and mechanisms that will help in, in, in gathering the kind of data required as a baseline for strategic thinking. Um, and and as, as, as you said, um, it is in Africa also, it is a, a, a new market and there is a, a space for the fundraiser to help in to help funders and donors uh, in, in designing their strategies and, and guiding their thinking um, and actually in helping the, the the fund recipients in reforming or, or or redesigning their their projects and their programs to to become uh, more more attractive and more palatable to potential donors also, and, and this is an actual actual experience in helping them to think, helping the, 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 the fund recipients to think about um, how, how, to, how to meet the needs of the donors um, in, in, their, um, in, their, in their project and program structures. In other words, um, donors, as, as everybody uh, participate, participating in this meeting probably knows, donors do not, all, they all give for a reason. Every donor wants something uh, from their donation. And it is, the, it is the job of the fundraiser and the, the fund recipient to identify what those wants and needs might be and design their projects and their programs and their operational plans in ways that meet the needs of the donors, thereby making themselves more attractive. Let, let me pick up on that point very briefly, because hopefully it's something that Astrid can also comment on. I mean, it, it, it is true to say that in Africa, there are a number of, of, of real standout causes that every large grant maker and foundation is aware of and corporates and so on. You know, things like food security, for example, you know, <laughs> basic education, access to public health, um, water, and so on and so forth. So there, there, and there, there is a plethora, I suppose, of different organizations, grant making organizations and philanthropists internationally that see that as being worthwhile causes. Does that, is that an advantage in Africa or is it both a curse and a blessing? I'll take a page out of Astrid's book and make it a positive. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think in, increasingly um, African countries and actually the continent as a whole is 
developing mechanisms to deal with the what I call competition uh, between the 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 plethora of causes um, and the competing needs of the um, organizations that are trying to meet these causes. I, I, I think the uh, governments are setting up funds, um, organizations are setting up, uh, what should I call them? Collaboratives, um, thematic collaboratives. Um, and I think, uh, referring back, just sort of referring back to something that Astrid said earlier, there are um, some causes that do receive a little bit of money from, from different um, government revenue generation mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, so the funds come to the cause. And if the organizations are registered with the government in, in Ghana, there's the Department of Social Welfare where you register uh, your organization, what it does. And if you're registered with them as, for example, um, uh, a reproductive health organization, that's one, or a malaria um, or, or organization, you would then be in the running to receive funding from those funds, those, you know, collected, that collected reservoir of funds. So in, in, in short, I guess, in, in different ways, yes. Um, the, the, the plethora of causes while increasing competition for limited, uh, for limited funding is actually an opportunity on the continent for collaboration and uh, innovat innovative thinking or innovative strategizing in how to access funds. Thank you. Yeah. Astrid, it's, it's Probably not the same in, in China, Hong Kong, right? No. <laughs> yeah. do, you want, do you want to comment very briefly on that? Certainly. Um, it's actually very different in China. And uh, it's, it, I find it an interesting model. And uh, let me explain to you why. So um, as I said earlier, the, the, the Chinese philanthropic market is highly regulated. Mm. So if you, know, if you don't have a public charity status, you cannot even go uh, and raise money. And then there's, your, there's different levels of that. And, and therefore, and it's a whole process to become accepted. Uh, also, the, those platforms that I mentioned earlier, they are sort of gatekeepers. So you have to go through this process and then you have to go through another process in order to be able to raise funds via these, these platforms. So this is, this is the one side of it, uh, it, uh, it being very highly regulated. And this also is uh, then the opportunity for the Chinese government to actually give out the main objectives of what these markets are meant to do. Uh, or what these philanthropists or these philanthropic activities are meant to do. So uh, for years and years, it has been education, which is a big topic in China and you know, also traditionally, of course, very highly valued and so forth. So it's, it's, that's a no brainer, you know, to, to, to convince Chinese people to donate to, donate, uh, to education is, is really an absolute no brainer. Uh, for the, the last, for this period of 2016 to 2020, the Chinese government has given out the missive that this is all about, about poverty reduction. Mm. So, uh, and what you will see is that in, in recent statistics, um, the, while individuals are still largely giving to education, uh, and then some are, have picked up poverty reduction, but in, in insignificant ways, at least of the, you know, there is a chart of the top 100 donors in, in China, which give in very extraordinarily high numbers. And, and there you don't find this topic of poverty reduction very much. But where you do find it is in company giving. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, uh, poverty reduction is factoring big time. And it, mm -hmm. this is where the majority of what they, uh, what they give goes to. And then they have a few other causes and uh, still they do give a little bit to education because they did that before, but now it's all about poverty reduction. And what I think is the advantage of it is that you have this whole society actually, you know, joining forces to meet one challenge. Excellent. And this is, you know, we in, in, in other countries, we may, you may think, you know, why does one regulate uh, in the US, you say, keep it as unregulated as possible. Mm -hmm. But I do think that uh, in this one respect, in order to have this society effort to make something to make to arrive at an improvement, this is actually an advantage. 
because now you're pooling resources and everybody is really, you know, dealing with this particular topic. So uh, they have also something that is the equivalent of the Giving Tuesday. It's mm -hmm. nine nine day, um, and nine is an auspicious number in in Chinese mythology, and so they have double nine. And double nine means it's particularly auspic auspicious. And uh, like they have double happiness. You may have seen this, you know, you see this at New Year's. So when it's double, it's particularly uh, auspicious. And, um, and so that whole day was also dedicated to this topic, which makes it then very interesting. You know, you suddenly, there's a breadth of recipients, people, many, many people participating, and they all are also now keyed into this particular topic. Thanks, Astrid. Uh, by the way, if you have any of that double happiness to hand out, please, I'll, 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 <laughs> we'll I'll, take it. <laughs> it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that uh, sounds <laughs> very promising. I mean, you know, you've given us a, a rosy picture, I guess, by and large, to the promise of uh, successful fundraising in both of these continents. Now, there must be a downside, right? So, I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk about the downside, the, the kind of, you know, if you can call them obstacles or difficulties in, in raising funds, either in the continent or from the continent. Before I move to the challenges, I, I, I just did want to sort of add to what um, Astrid was just saying about China and um, sort of talk a little bit about the frameworks and the collaborative nature of, of fundraising on the continent, increasingly across the continent, government, national budgets are being built along, are being developed along the SDG framework. Mm -hmm. um, organizations are developing the, the operational plans along the SDG framework. Um, and funders are also thinking about their giving along the SDG framework. And so despite there being so many, um, different causes and interests and issues. Uh, this, this framework and the um, continental push to meet the uh, goals of the SDGs, mm. of the SDGs, uh, so, sort of it, it guides and pushes um, donations, fundraising, mm. and even execution of um, of interventions on the continent. So I guess that's to say that the SDG framework is a, a bit of kind of an advantage um, in, in, in fundraising on the continent. As far as challenges, for me, the most, uh, the most difficult challenge in fundraising on the continent or on my part of the continent at any rate is the lack of information, the lack of data um, about donors uh, and what they give to. Mm -hmm. Donations on the con continent, as I mentioned earlier, are, are largely community driven, uh, largely driven sort of in, in, in you know, the, the area where you, you were born or driven to where you went to school. And so it becomes a, a, a little bit difficult to, to then move donors from those interest areas to the broader uh, needs that are sort of highlighted by the SDGs and that kind of thing. So that would be two things. The lack of data uh, about donor, donors and, and what they're giving to and the community and the community focused nature of, of donations or philanthropy on the continent. To me, those are the two main challenges. Thank you. That's true. Yeah, so in, in Asia, you have a, a more of a mixed picture, you know, so you have, we have some markets that are very well documented, uh, Japan, China, uh, so South Korea, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, those are very well documented and you know a lot about giving habits of people there. And then you have, and I do not know exactly how it is with India and a couple of the other larger countries in Asia, how, how good the documentation is there. And then, but then you really have a large number of especially smaller countries where we don't have any information really as to how fundraising goes. It's, it's, it's a hit and miss. 
Uh, in terms of challenges, um, I want to say that one of the um, the topic of the SDGs is one of them too. You know mm -hmm. that um, it, it is difficult for uh, communities to to embrace this because there are other needs that seem to be more prevalent. And while connected, uh, oftentimes information in terms of how these things are connected is also is lacking. Um, China has its very particular challenges in terms of fundraising there, you know, fundraising from Chinese people, if you are somewhere else in the world, is quite difficult. And mm -hmm. that has to do with the fact that, especially with the rise of China to becoming a more and more um, powerful and important nation, which, which is a process that this, the, the, the generation of people who are able to give have really lived through. You know, from if you look at how how China has uh, arisen from a third world country, you know, there's no other word for the word for this. Even though I know it's they are called development countries and so on, but they have been speaking about this like this themselves. They said, you know, we're a third world country, and now we are we were a third world country, and now we no longer are, mm -hmm. and uh, they are also far beyond what uh, the, the emerging markets, if you will, you know, they are nowadays a very highly developed market. So, mm -hmm. so this whole uh, rise of, of China to uh, power to be noted uh, mm -hmm. in, in global inter and international politics is something that has been very important to this generation of donors. And so the, the first and foremost thing that they all support, and you see this from overseas Chinese as well, is donations go into China. This is about developing the country. And it goes in many different ways, you know, not, not everybody will necessarily, of the overseas Chinese will necessarily uh, agree with the politics of the country, but where it goes, and this goes to the point that you were making, but then it goes very, very local. Chinese overseas, uh, overseas Chinese give to their, uh, the origin, to do those communities where their families originate from. There is, and this has to do with Chinese uh, beliefs because you honor your ancestors. So ancestry and where you come from is extremely important. So something not to ever disregard mm -hmm. for, for any fundraiser, you know, it, this is also why, um, you know, to, to convince a Chinese person to not donate to their ancestral village and instead give to your university, which is now in Boston or so, <laughs> is a good attempt. <laughs> I'm not sure how successful you will be, you know? uh, and um, and then you know there's there's maybe now another generation of uh, Chinese overseas Chinese who have really um, been very successful in dot com, let me call it uh, for simply so for simplicity's sake in the dot com area and uh, have made significant fortunes. And they owe, owe some of this success to their alma maters, which are oftentimes American universities or English universities or whatnot. And they will give some to it, mm -hmm. but it, it's probably not the majority of what they do in terms of giving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then when you, as a foreign organization, you want to go into China to raise money, it becomes really complicated <laughs> uh, because you don't, foreign NGOs are not allowed to raise money in China by law. So they've passed a, new, passed a new law and this now firmly prescribes that foreign organizations are not allowed to raise money in China. Mm -hmm. So if you are have a presence as a foreign organization in China, you need to find some foundation with whom you collaborate. Mm -hmm. And then all the giving goes through this particular foundation. And this foundation then needs to have the, the public charity status and needs to have you know, um, have performed properly at this and needs to prove every other year that they are still performing according to standard and so forth. So, uh, so they will also be very careful as to who they take on it's because mm -hmm. this is, might be dangerous for them as well. So there's, there's, there's a big caveat. I have a friend who's actually raising money in Southwest China and uh, he, he works for a foreign organization and they are raising money for preschools. And, um, he has he writes to me occasionally and says oh it's been going like this and that and you know then he asked me do you know anybody who is willing to give some money into for preschools in china i said mm, difficult <laughs> but don't think about it <laughs> you know but um but he speaks specifically about this he says every time that somebody he identifies somebody to give he has to go through this process 
Mm. But he's been also quite successful. So over the last 15 years, he's raised something along the lines of 12 million euros, which is also not bad. And they have funded along the line of about 50 preschools in, in, in Southwest China. So uh, I don't want to discourage people. I just want to make sure that everybody's aware there's several loops to jump through in order to be able to do fundraising inside of China. Mm. In, interestingly, um, um, Astrid, your your remarks that brought did did bring to mind um, the simil similarities a little bit between um, and you see it's difficult it's it kind of comparing Africa to Africa to China is like comparing apples to oranges um, at, at best yes. probably now, apples to papayas or <laughs> yes so. now, or, or great maybe grapes um, I think. Africa would be the grapes and China would be the orange, you know, because it, it's it's several different um, regulatory systems, several different cultures, several different, um, they, they're all at different stages in their um, uh, philanthropy and fundraising journey. Um, but I, I think, as you said, the, the community focused funding as a fundraiser with, um, actually several of my past employers, IPPF Africa region being one of them and the Africa Philanthropy Network. And of course, working with Africans Rising, which I'm currently doing. It's been interesting because they're mm, continental, or, or three of them are continental organizations. But the nature of the, the, the thinking about fundraising or the thinking about philanthropy and giving on the continent is such that very seldom will you find a donor in let's say Nigeria, uh, where they do have a lot of high net worth donors um, who are generous and, and focused and strategic in their giving, mm -hmm. but very seldom would you find them giving to a continental organization. Mm -hmm. They'll give to an organization that is targeting the their country of mm -hmm. origin mm -hmm. and this was a problem i run into and i continue to run into right now because it, it it means you you almost have to fragment your your operations and your work in order to as the entire continent is now focused on attract african donors mm. because there is really no such thing as an african donor there's a Ghanaian donor, there's a Nigerian donor, there's a mm, Senegalese, Somalian, if you see what I mean. So it, 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 it forces you into a fragmented way of thinking. Um, but I think with time um, and as the corporate uh, or big business be becomes a more important player um, and <laughs> the rest of the continent kind of starts to learn from South Africa, where um, the South Africa, the bigger country, so it's perhaps different, but um, we're, going to, we're going to start seeing more uh, continental businesses funding uh, continental activities. Mm. All right, I, we, we have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to oh, hone right. in on, on two, it's gone very fast. I'm gonna hone in on two last questions. The, the first one is about, you know, very specifically to do with practicalities. The, we're all aware of the, the so-called um, fundraising cycle, you know, uh, prospect research, identification, cultivation, solicitation, and uh, you know, the ask and the money comes in. Is, it, is that way of fundraising still appropriate in Africa and in Asia, or is there a different way of doing it? And brief answers, and the second, area I'm going to look at is this whole area of COVID-19. Has it changed things dramatically in terms of fundraising over the last year? So the first question is about practicalities. Does one use the fundraising cycle to fundraise in Africa and Asia in the same way that we normally have? I would say this might be true, but I think it is also true that you have to really consider seriously the cultural differences. So um, while you know the cycle in itself might still be true, but the way the way you do it is definitely different by country, 
uh, certainly in, in, in Asia, you know, uh, I mean, you have some large dividing factors. You have largely Muslim populations in some countries and you have largely uh, Hindu populations in some countries, largely Buddhist and sometimes uh, and a few other countries with, with some Christian minorities and so forth. So that, that definitely is, is important. And it's not only important in terms of religious fundraising, but it's also important in terms of other fundraising because it has to do with where, where the impulse to give is seated. So I would say, and the other thing that I was going to say is that this is also, I think the fragmentation is a hallmark of the emerging markets. And um, the SDGs, you know, that have, have the possibility to unite people is something that um, people are, are getting more and more aware of also in, in the Asian, Asian realm. And therefore, you know, I believe that um, over time, um, these topics are going to become more important. And then, and now coming back to the cultivation cycle, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it will eventually be possible to cultivate people towards this to these SDGs because they, there's an understanding that you know this matters in the region and it matters certainly in some of the bigger countries uh, no question they see it every every day so that's in terms of that and I'm passing out to Karen now for <laughs> the last nine minutes and then you as, come back to your second question as um, far as um, as far as um, the the cycle the you know the sort of logistics of fundraising. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't think we can get, get away from that um, as, as a fundraiser and having done it for the last, what, probably 25, I won't tell you anymore, 20 plus years. Um, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's an integral part of, mm -hmm. of the process. But uh, I think that what is perhaps as important uh, two things that are perhaps as important um, in on the continent is what I, I think I've heard loosely referred to as friend raising rather than fundraising, which is you know the relationship uh, building behind uh, philanthropy and behind fundraising and behind uh, solicitation, cultivation, and all of that. The business of building the trust and and building the story and. Uh, matching the, the need to the donor's interest and, 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 and just knowing each other a little bit. That's one. And then two is something that was discussed at great length at one of the conferences I went to a few years ago. I think it's the Edge Funders Group there in, there in the US, uh, the conference that was at Berkeley. And, and they were talking about the character of fundraising and uh, managing funds. Over, over a period of time, um, large swathes of beneficiaries have been left out because of the requirements of the donors. Um, you need four financial reports. You need, um, you need to have a specific number of employees. You need to be able to generate a, a certain report at a certain time or you need to generate more reports than the money you're getting is worth that kind of thing has mm. knocked a whole swathe of very valid and important causes off the fundraising uh, turntable uh, so i think uh, those are two things that that are of importance to think about. Brilliant. Yeah. Right. Now we can't ignore the fact that we're living in a strange world, in a strange time. <laughs> so let, <laughs> let us spend a little time for the last seven or eight minutes talking about the way in which, uh, if any, and, and how COVID-19 has affected fundraising in, in Asia on the one hand and Africa on the other. Okay. So, and... In China, to be very clear, mm. it hasn't affected fundraising because it doesn't exist. Uh -huh. So uh, there has been the time in when it first, when the, when the pandemic first broke loose, mm -hmm. when of course, you know, um, a lot of help was needed. And again, overseas Chinese pitched in and they really helped to, to provide, you know, all sorts of materials that were needed in order to help the many patients in, in the Wuhan region specifically. But uh, then, of course, they had this very uh, intense shutdown, and my brother-in-law actually lived through it. He lives in, in, in northeastern China right now, and he lived through it, and it was very intense and very radical. And um, 
according to Chinese authorities, this has completely squelched the virus. So you have little outbra outbreaks, but in very insignificant numbers in the outer parts of China, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, basically in the Western regions, because they are not so Chinese. And, and that's about it. You know, it doesn't happen so much in, uh, there is not, therefore there's not, not this particular effect of COVID on the fundraising abilities. But what is also true is that, you know, others report that, you know, uh, of course, food insecurity has uh, become huge in, in, in Asian countries. Mm. Uh, Vietnam, for example, has, com has completely dropped its, its rice production uh, uh, during, during the shutdown. And therefore, you know, now, now there's many, many are no longer able, no longer provided with food. And you can you can easily see how such one such fact would have a ripple effect on everything to do with with um, with the third sector in, in such a country. You know that uh, when the basics fall out at the bottom, everything else becomes is affected. But no specific numbers on it, unfortunately. I can't can't help with that. Thanks, Esther. Karen. Um, <laughs> that despite the um, the the trajectory of the pandemic on the continent, which has not been as steep, I believe, as in other places. COVID has had a huge effect um, on fundraising and in some ways good and in some ways bad. COVID has, um, what should I say? It, it's resulted in a, a kind of uh, coming together um, where businesses are, are donating large amounts of money to, to government. It, 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 to, to support their efforts to uh, protect the populace and to make sure that people have water and have food and, uh, and it, it is actually mostly water and food and, and to get us back to work. This was primarily doing during the lockdown or has been, is during the lockdown period. Uh, Ghana, for example, is not on lockdown anymore uh, to the same extent. So immediately the focus on supporting the government and supporting the poor has dissipated. Um, that being said, as far as a fundraiser, I feel that the, the virus has hmm, diluted the, the mission focus of mm -hmm. fundraising across the board. I, I feel that uh, over the last six months, we've stopped thinking as fundraisers and, 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 and uh, leaders of development work. We've stopped thinking about development work. We've, we've mm -hmm. stopped thinking about poverty reduction and we've stopped thinking about reproductive health and education and so on. And we're talking about COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And as a fundraiser, I can't say it causes me sleepless nights, but I do wake up in the morning sometimes thinking, how are we going to move the narrative um, mm. to, to join COVID-19 to, to the other uh, development focus mm. points, to the other uh, development agendas that are still there, uh, you know, and have been hugely impacted by COVID, you know, women's empowerment, the girl child, education, reproductive health, uh, I could, we all, we know these, we, we, we know the issues. I think, uh, Bruno, you listed quite a few of them earlier on, um, but they have been pretty much, um, what's the word I'm looking for, covered. Um, they, they, we don't see them anymore because mm -hmm. of COVID. And that concerns me as a fundraiser. Thirdly, if you don't mind my adding, I, I was looking at something and, and, and looking at um, earlier today, at trends in giving. Mm. Um, so COVID-19 has changed things significantly, but interestingly, it hasn't changed the projections about the levels of giving. Donors mm. are still giving a lot. Mm. They're still giving in the same places they've always given. Some of them are even giving more. But I think the problem is that their giving is now targeted to COVID-related work, if, if, that, if that makes sense. 
that makes perfect sense. In yeah. fact, what, what has come out for me is the complicated and complex nature of the work that we do. Yeah. You know, it's always seen as being something that um, doesn't carry much weight, but there, it is a calling. I really do believe that those of us that do this work do it because we want to make a difference in the world and that we are special kinds of people that devote ourselves to doing this in a business-like and professional manner, as good as any profession and any other business. It's just different. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, the complexities that are involved in our work, I think is um, seldom comes through as well as it has come through on the discussion on these two vast continents that are so different <laughs> and uh, both between each other and within each mm -hmm. continent. So I'm, I'm going to give the opportunity for a couple of final thoughts that you might have thought of during the course of the session of you know, anything that has come out from the other speaker that you might want to comment on or anything that you suddenly remember that huh, I'd like to talk about this briefly. I, I just want to share a few um observations on on the on the Chinese fundraising market because I'm finding them interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we did not speak so much about individual donors, but there are some interesting uh, trends there in the sense that, um, you know, we have about one in five of the world's billionaires nowadays lives in China. Mm -hmm. um, the the largest donor in 2019 was a woman, mm -hmm. which I find important to note. Uh, her giving was to education and uh, and some other uh, unspecified items as it as it's being told so can't can't say what it is but uh, I found that in itself very interesting among these this group of uh, one the 100 top philanthropists in China is about a third who are women which I'm also finding rather interesting uh, mm -hmm. we would probably not find the same uh, ratio in other countries um, there's also some interesting trends in terms of um, monthly giving, which is something that has not been prevalent in China at all. Mm. And um, they have, um, you know, and when, when you basically do your giving, as I described before on those platforms, whenever you shop something, you might consider to give something, you know, mm. you may have, but there was no regularity in it. It's now emerging, and it's emerging among younger donors, which is also an interesting fact. I find, you know, that uh, here we would, uh, in Germany at least, and in the U.S. it's the same. You know, it's the it's the elderly who think about monthly donations because they don't forget, <laughs> essentially, you know, and <laughs> to make it just make it just convenient for them. Uh, I would I would qualify for one of those, you know. So I don't forget, you know, you know it's just deducted from my bank account and fine. In China, it's the other way around. It's the younger donors where, where this emerges. And I found that quite surprising. Mm -hmm. I also want to share a few other little, a couple of other little things. So I did talk about the beggars who raise money via cell phone. There's also some interesting organizations in China, something that is called a gongo, which is actually a government, not owned, but government operated uh, NGO. <laughs> So, also very interesting, a government operated non government operation <laughs> organization. And, and then of course, you know, there are all sorts of other NGOs in, in, in the country there too. But I thought that is kind of, a, it's kind of interesting, it's unusual and a little bit amusing. And um, last but not least, I want to say that um, in China, well, there's one thing that is very interesting, and this is you do talk about money. So not as it is in Western cultures so much that we don't talk about money. There you do talk about it. Money is, mm. uh, and wealth is seen as, as auspicious. You know, the wealthy, the, the, the people are wealthy because they did well and mm. they, they did good. And so there's, there's a connection seen between this. And, um, and you know, when, uh, when, I used to, when I lived in China, one of the things that you would always hear is, what was the price of this when you had something? They looked at your mm -hmm. book, they looked at a gadget or whatever. They would ask, what, what did it cost? And they would mm -hmm. talk about this. So this is the one thing. The other thing that Chinese people love to talk about is food. <laughs> so <laughs> they, they always <laughs> greet each other by saying, did you eat already? <laughs> food All right, well, big topic. It's, al it's almost lunchtime. So let, let's it's Karen, almost let's lunchtime. To, yeah. <laughs> Karen, do, do you want to? Yeah, very, very briefly, I, I, I think um, one, one of the things that 
one of the trends that I'm seeing in, in the last perhaps oh, five years that is especially, perhaps less, that is especially, interest, especially interesting to me is across the continent, the desire for Africa to support itself. Mm -hmm. um, in, since time immemorial, we've been funding our development work from external sources, um, ODA from the USAID, DFID, that kind of, actually, and even individual donors um, off the continent. Um, a, 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 I must add that a lot, of, a lot of funding does come from Africans in the diaspora in the form of remittances. Mm -hmm. um, but increasingly across the continent, we're encouraging ourselves to focus on funding uh, development work, development efforts on the continent in an effort to, mm, to strengthen or enhance the voice of Africa at the table where the development agendas are being developed. Um, if you're not a part of it, you can't really speak to it. And um, while it's difficult and, you know, given some of the challenges that we've outlined in, in this conversation, uh, it, it is happening and, and, and I'm excited to say that I'm, I'm a part of that. In making that effective, uh, in, in getting Africa to, as several leaders have spoken about, to become an Africa without aid, uh, although I'm not exactly sure what that means because we're not there yet, um, but I think an Africa, an Africa that plays a part in developing its own aid is perhaps what we're talking about. Um, we do need to focus on strengthening and creating networks um, on the continent. And, and when I say networks, I mean continental ne networks, such as the Africa Philanthropy ne Network from country to country, with countries talking to each other about the problems they're facing and learning from each other. Um, and we need to develop continental strategies for fundraising. Um, and actually global strategies for fundraising. Uh, Star Ghana, if, I don't know if you've heard of it, Star Ghana is one of our foundations, newly formed foundations um, in Ghana that is founded as, as a legacy of, uh, I think it's perhaps a 10 year donation from external donors who as uh, Ghana gained, which one, middle income status, they all started to pull out of funding development. You know, it's a whole political conversation about why and how, but they started to pull out. And as a function of pulling out, they mm -hmm. agreed that they didn't want to leave a vacuum in that space. And so they decided to fund the startup of a foundation. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the kind of strategic uh, collaborative strategy that we need to be thinking more about as far as fundraising on the continent. This has been a wide ranging and really interesting conversation for me. And I have no doubt that whoever views our discussion is going to find it equally so. I therefore thank you, Astrid. Thank you for your inputs and your insights. Karen, likewise, for your particular views in an area that many people won't know anything about. <laughs> and we look forward to welcoming all of the participants in viewing our discussion on the 18th of November. Mm -hmm.